Welcome in to the PFF NFL podcast. We're renaming it again, Sam, because we're going to podcast one. All right, let's get right to it, okay? Right to it, AFC preview. We're going to hit every team in the AFC, and we're going to do it rapid fire. You ready to go? I don't know that you have rapid fire in you. What do you mean? You slow us down half the time. No. See, you're slowing us down now. All right, AFC. Let's start in the West. Everybody always goes east to west. We're starting in the West. Chargers, Chiefs, Raiders, and Broncos. Let's start with, do you have a pick real quick? Who do you think? Who, who, who do you like? Well, obviously the Chargers division. are going to the Super Bowl. Mike right told to the us Super that. Bowl. Right to the Super Bowl. Mike told us Mike. that. So th- looking at this division, Chargers are looking pretty good because they're strong in the right places. I know our analytics guys have uh, the Chiefs still as number one, I believe, right? Chiefs and Chargers pretty close. Uh, the Raiders seem to be that team that maybe has a little bit too much hype that they don't need. They're going to crush the 1998 season. Oh, man, I can't wait to watch Gruden in action. And then the Broncos, they're just like a weird team to me because I feel like their roster has just gotten slowly worse over the last couple of years. But, you know, but Case Keenum. a lot better at quarterback. Yeah, Case Keenum's looking good at quarterback so far. So how, how are we seeing this division shape up here, Sam? Yeah, I think the Chargers have the best roster top to bottom, um, assuming it, you know, keeps intact. Like every time you injure one of their players, obviously that, that takes a sledgehammer to that roster. And this right. is the Chargers, so that happens seemingly on a weekly basis. Um, they should be the team to come away with this division. The Chiefs, I think, may be the most fun team in the NFL to watch if scoring points is your thing. Oh, gosh, Either yeah. way, this is they're going to be like watching an arena league team. It's going to be Patrick Mahomes in a weekly shootout with somebody who can't stop scoring on a defense that has Kendall Fuller and nobody else in the secondary. Uh, so that should be pretty chaotic. The Raiders, I have no earthly idea what it is they're building. Um, other than the fact that they're digging into 1976 tape, <laughs> Gruden's... Is- Looking for, you know, everybody that's impressed him over the past 10 years is coming on board. And maybe no Khalil Mack. But by the time you even hear this, maybe no Khalil Mack. Yeah, their best player by a distance over the past couple of years is apparently persona non grata there. Yeah. He's like not that. He's not there? It's like not welcome. Oh, oh, not welcome. So he'll be potentially gone. English. Um, That's not even, yeah. Anyway, I was adding a bit of culture, Steve to the podcast. See, I've got my things. little Ireland mug down here. Anyone I have uh, I have my Harry Palazzolo mug. That's my son. He's getting up there. You're on one. YouTube. That's that's not even close to his current. Oh, I know. I know. I need a new He's one. about four feet taller than that now. Yes, he is. He is um, literally despite, off the charts. Despite only being a couple checkups. of years older than that. Right. Yeah, he's off the charts per his uh, three-year-old checkup. Welcome back, YouTubers, by the way. Yeah, We're it, back on YouTube. On it camera may camera. surprise people to know that your children are quite large. They are. Uh, yeah. Assuming anybody doesn't know, Steve himself is quite large. 6'10". Allegedly 6'10". I'm listed at 6'10". You are listed at 6'10". It turns out medical science evaluates you slightly smaller than that. Uh, I'm also listed at 260 on the internet yes. when you go look so, at my player so page. So you're shorter than your listed size and heavier than your listed size at the moment. Pushing. That's really what happens to all of us as we age, isn't it? We get wider and we get shorter. Shorter and fatter, yeah. Um, but anyway, the upshot of this is Steve's kid is almost literally half the age of my child, and I think they're the same size, right? Yeah, sounds about right. Yeah. We had a little birthday party last week. It was fun. Thanks for coming. You're welcome. Yeah. Anyway. What are we talking about? Uh, why the Raiders are going to win the 1998 season. So yeah. we've done that. John Who's Drew. the last team in that division? Denver. So Denver, the roster you write, I think, is heading in the wrong direction or has been for a while. But they got better at quarterback. I think they've got a real steal at running back in Royce Freeman. Um, he's yeah, I like really that. He's looking really good in free like preseason. And honestly, the defense is kind of still good. You know, they were, they were coming down from such a high point that it's still going to be decent. So I think the Denver Broncos could bounce back a little bit this year. I just don't think they're going to be as good as they were when they were, you know, arguably the best team in the NFL. Yeah, so Denver's roster kind of looks like a transitional roster to me a little bit. I kind of like what they're doing at receiver, bringing in Cortland Sutton and uh, Deshaun Hamilton. Emmanuel Sanders looks great this preseason. Uh, To me, it's still this Case Keenum question, right? I mean, how good – he was really good last year. Can he duplicate that? Uh, going to an outdoor stadium here, Sam. You know, we can't play in the Dome all the time. Uh-huh. Uh, so, you know, that's a big question for uh, for the Broncos, having Case Keenum. But like you're saying, last couple of years they've been rolling through, you know, Trevor Simeon and, uh, you know, just not not a great situation over so there. So if you had to order this con- this division, right, Chargers 1. Chargers, Chiefs. Chiefs 2, although they're going to be Arena League style. I'd say Raiders, Broncos, though. I think it's going to go the other way around. I think... Chargers, Chiefs, 
Broncos, Raiders. So the thing about Oakland is last year at this time, we were talking about them and the Titans as these like AFC contenders, right? And they were playing week one. And obviously, Oakland had a very disappointing season last year. But they're two years removed for being a very good team that didn't have a chance in the playoffs because Derek Carr got hurt. Mm -hmm. Derek Carr, if he gets back on track, I still think he's a very good quarterback. That is a significant boost for them if he can get back to where he was in 2015 and 16. But they could potentially have no Khalil Mack. They may have no decent offensive tackle at the moment, depending on what happens with Donald Penn. This yeah, so they're is, moving him from the left side to the right side. This is a team that's heading, I think, in the wrong direction. No, that's fair. It, and it's still going to come down to coverage for them. It was bad last year, and there's not necessarily signs of, uh, signs of life this year. Yeah, I mean, they're relying a lot on a lot of young players, which right. is never usually a great sign for success. Yeah, and then uh, with Kansas City, you mentioned Arena League style because we've got Patrick Mahomes throwing to Tyreek Hill, deep threat. Sammy Watkins, deep threat. Travis Kelsey, probably him and Gronk, the two best vertical tight ends in the game. And Kareem Hunt out of the backfield. That's fun. Mm -hmm. And Mahomes, my question with Mahomes, though, as good as he is at throwing the ball down the field, could he actually duplicate Alex Smith's league-leading numbers last year? So it's kind of an underrated story. Is Mahomes a better deep passer in you know downfield thrower than Alex Smith? Over time, yes. But can he, can he duplicate what was Alex Smith's you know, career year last year which was the best in the league. I mean, there's also separating being able to hurl the ball 70 yards in the air with true. accurately throwing it 30 yards in stride to a well-covered guy. Very true. So, you know, can he do things that Alex Smith can't even dream of? Yes. Can he consistently be as good a deep thrower as Alex Smith was last year? I doubt it because he was pretty obscene last year. And as long as the Chargers stay healthy, we've got Phillip Rivers is still good. Yes. Keenan, Keenan Allen top five wide receiver last year joey bosa melvin ingram led all the best duo rushing the passer last year total pressures 151 casey hayward in the secondary best corner in the league best corner in the league they just added the great derwin james yes to that defense desmond king desmond king one of the best slot corners last year and we expect that to go forward as long as the offensive line gets a little bit better still have melvin gordon in the backfield they're strong in a lot of key areas would like to have that one more pass game piece with hunter henry going down though at tight end yeah no that was a big blow but this is the best roster in the division it should win the division but we've been saying that for years and it keeps the wheels keep falling off so we're both gonna jump on the Chargers bandwagon to win the west yeah let's do it i believe the analytics guys do have the chiefs though am i right i should check I their work i think so they're over at the pff forecast be sure to check them out they're also here with us on podcast one if you're subscribed to us you should also be subscribed to the pff forecast george and eric all right let's move to the afc south how's that sound okay going to the south jaguars colts titans and the texans let's start with the texans you've been very vocal at least here at the office over in our cincinnati office here that we have to work looking across from you every single day Mm. and i keep hearing you complaining about the overhyped houston texans yeah, I mean, people are talking about them winning the division. Somebody was talking about them being a Super Bowl contender. Like, why? This team is not in good shape. They have the entire logic is based on the fact that Deshaun Watson was really, really good for seven games, and they have potentially J.J. Watt and Jadavian Clowney back. Now, okay, yeah. both those things are potentially true, but even if that is true, that probably isn't enough to be a Super Bowl contender. No. Like, the, the Patriots wouldn't be Super Bowl contenders if it was just Tom Brady and two really good edge rushers. Right. I get it. They need more than that. I, and the Texans have maybe the worst offensive line we've ever seen on yeah. paper. They're banking on, a, they're, they're banking on a lot of duplication of what Deshaun Watson did last Which year. Which, in and of itself, is extremely unlikely. Yes. So, uh, there's look, I'm trying to figure out a way to be encouraged by Deshaun Watson and think he has a bright future and really rip the hearts out of Texans fans and say there's no way he does what he did last year, Mm -hmm. statistically. There's just no way. Almost so many numbers that we point to point to regression from just general touchdown percentage to the fact that he only had two drops last season. I mean, he may be... Garbage time touchdowns, all these things. This year, he may be a better player and have worse statistics. I think that's a very likely situation and that was my prediction last year for the second half of the year i was like guys he's going to get worse statistically but probably get better from say a pff grade standpoint which is what matters long term pff grade over time if you're better your stats should match up so i think there are enough question marks with the texans with deshaun watson likely regressing 
with DeAndre Hopkins still needing a running mate on the other side. You still have, you know, a little bit of deep threat with Will Fuller, but, you know, where are the other weapons there? And then the question marks with the returning J.J. Watt, returning Whitney Merciless coming off of injury. When they're healthy, like they were in 2016, it was a beautiful pass rush with Watt, Merciless, and Jadavian Clowney. But in 2016, they had A.J. Boye in the secondary. That was the biggest difference last year. Yeah. Not the injuries up front. It was the coverage and the back end was far worse. So they Houston. brought on Tyrone Matthew, who has, who has playmaking ability. He's got the potential to do an awful lot of good for that secondary. But outside of him, I mean, Jonathan Joseph, how old is he at this point? Uh, over 32, over 33. So yes. right. that's too old for corners, right? generally. Unless you're a Terrence Newman. Yes, who seems to be able to go on forever. And even he is being moved to safety. Um, Kevin Johnson, Aaron Colvin, Jonathan Badamosi. I mean, this is not a good-looking secondary. There aren't that many talented players there, and the ones that are talented are old. Yeah, that's about right. So that's the problem. So we're expecting regression from the Houston Texans. Let's go to the Colts. Uh, Andrew Luck, I mean, he's playing, so he should be there. I'm fascinated to see how much they try to strip out. Do we have a new captain for this week? The, the downfield stuff. Oh, do we? Let's find out. I'll let Let's you search this that. on the fly. You my talk. question, yeah, my question with the Colts and Andrew Luck, they're trying to protect him. They're trying to run the quick game and all that stuff, which he's very good at, by the way. But one of the things that has made Luck very good early in his career, those seven-step drops where he drives the ball down the field, and even though he'll throw a few too many turnover-worthy plays historically, he's a big play guy. And I think the Colts are still sitting on this roster that's slightly underrated, but a step away from you know being near the best even just in the AFC South. Uh, the other underrated story, I think, with the Colts is just how well unsung players played last year. Al Woods up front and Marcus Hunt and how good Jabal Sheard was rushing off the edge. Duplicating that is going to be a big question mark. And then we talked about coverage and corners and all that stuff. Their cornerback depth chart, Sam. Pierre Desir, Kenny Moore, Quincy Wilson, Nate Hairston. Not a lot of big names in the back end there. I know they're, uh, Colts fans say, well, they're, they're playing cover two, so you don't need good corners. You can hide all those guys. First off, you don't play cover two every time. You're, they're going to play about 30% cover two, 30 35%, uh, which, by the way, kind of limits Malik Hooker's oh, yeah. special center field ability, mm-hmm. just, just you know, so you know. Um, but you can't hide corners no matter what the scheme is. You got something? Yeah, we got uh, the captains coming to Cincinnati for the uh, final preseason go, game. We should go say hello. So... Uh, uh, it's actually in a few hours. We should go. I know. Recording right? here on Thursday. Uh, so anyway, cue the music, the uh, the Ken Burns music. We've got. Let's read. Let's read two of them, right? Because they're okay. both Cincinnati. Dearest mother, the unit moves out this morning to Cincinnati to battle a unit of tigers for one final exercise. Do not fret. I shall not see action. Likely, nor shall their cat leader, Captain Andy Dalton, a commander so intense it has been said his head is ablaze. <laughs> I miss you, Andrew. And then the latest one, just five hours ago. Dearest Mother, the unit has reached the outskirts of Cincinnati. We prepare for a final exercise tonight against the Tiger Men. Scouts report one of their top soldiers is covered in gangrene, or perhaps simply his name is green. It will be discovered soon enough. Andrew. That's AJ. It is. I like it. Good stuff. The captain Captain. is still the best thing about the Indianapolis Colts season. Yeah, he's great. We should read it every week. I like it. The bottom line, though, with the Colts is that it, I mean, it's been for years. It's kind of all down to Andrew Luck. If he is it back is. to his best, or even something like his best, he can drag a pretty terrible roster to playoff contention. Um, the problem is now the Jacksonville Jaguars are in that division. And I don't mean that they weren't before, but like they weren't you know, a force to be reckoned with before. It wasn't actually a relevant piece yeah. of information in the a past. A new Jaguars yes. team. Now it is a piece of relevant information that the Jaguars actually have a really good roster, and you're going to have to do something special to overcome them. Well, let's discuss the Jags because defensively, they've got pretty much all their important pieces back. Uh, the defensive line that we ranked, or pass rush, I think, that we ranked at number two coming into the season. Uh, a deep pass rush when you look at Calais Campbell, Yannick Ngakwe, Dante Fowler when he's on the field, Malik Jackson. So they're deep there. They have athletic linebackers, Telvin Smith, Miles Jack. I mean, Blair Brown, their backup, I think would be a great nickel linebacker in a lot of other systems with the way he plays in coverage. And then, of course, the back end, Jalen Ramsey, A.J. Boye, Barry Church, Tashawn Gibson, and they even added new pieces, guys like Ronnie Harrison in the draft. I mean, they are building something special, I think, defensively. And the question mark, just like last preseason, is what is Blake Bortles going to be doing 
Last preseason, Bortles looked like he had the yips. He couldn't even make an easy throw. This year, it's just he's blinds to linebackers. And historically, <laughs> even though he was solid last year, still a lot to rely on Bortles. Well, I've made this case before. He was solid for much of last year. But only once they took the game so far out of his hands that it would have been almost impossible not to be. Right, or, like they beat more, the Steelers the first time with 14 passes. Or more to the point, they got to a point where what they needed to do to take the game out of his hands, any quarterback could have been solid. So it's not even that you know Blake Bortles played particularly well. It's that literally any quarterback could have done that at that point. I which, think you're saying like replacement level. Yeah, so he, they, they made the game essentially a replacement level quarterback job because they just handed it off all the time to Leonard Fournette in that running game and said the quarterback's not going to be a problem in this game. Which is fine, but if you're going to rely on that, you know, you've got issues because some, sooner or later you're going to run into a team that can stop the run because you don't have you know, a phenomenal offensive line. You just grind people endlessly until you get a weight of statistics when it comes to um, cumulative rushing yards. So somebody's going to be able to stop that running game and Blake Bortles is going to have to pass the ball, and that's when the wheels are going to fall off. Yeah, so you just hoping the, you hoping the defense is really extra special. Yeah, the other problem they have is that that wide receiver group doesn't look phenomenal. They just lost Marquise Lee to injury for the season. It's DJ Chark. It's Keelan Cole. It's Dede Westbrook. I mean, there's some talent there, but there's Dante a lot of Moncrief, question marks. maybe. No. No, you don't believe in Moncrief? No. Ever? No. He's not going to break out this year or any year. People have been calling for the breakout for 12 years now. Yeah, it's never going to happen. So what I think it does... They do you have DeAndre Smelter, though. You do like him. You do like him. I liked him, him before he Tech. tore his knee to pieces. Right. So... Uh, so I think what it does, it just puts pressure on the offensive coordinator, you know, because they, they protected Bortles so much last year, like you said, that they did sneak a few g- good games out of him. And that's, you know, perfect play calls and, and taking this receiver group that's not good and elevating their play and putting them in position to succeed. That's just a risky way to play football. Particularly when Blake Bortles, even whatever you think about him, whether he's good, bad or indifferent, he is volatile. Yes. Can we all agree on that? However good you think he is, he will throw a lot of bad plays to go along with the good plays he can make. So if you are limiting what you ask of him, typically you do that with the plan that the guy just doesn't screw up the game, right? Whatever you do, don't throw an interception, and we've got this. If you can't even rely on him not throwing the interception when you do that, that's a problem. I mean, at that point, if that is your game plan, we're going to roll into the season, we're going to rely on Jalen Ramsey, the best defense in the league, we're going to shut everybody down, we're going to pound the ball on offense, and then all your, your job is don't throw it away. If that is the game plan, and people are going to hate this, is Cody Kessler not the better oh, option? Oh, man, there it is. Oh, you're saying Cody Kessler's a better game manager? I'm, yeah. A last better. Year, by the way, last year at this time, Browns fans were just up in arms, screaming at you because you suggested that Cody Kessler is a better quarterback than, than Deshaun, Deshaun Kaiser. Kaiser. And he was. I'm just saying if – whether or not you think he is a better quarterback for every system, if your game plan is to have a game manager who just doesn't throw the ball away, is Cody Kessler not a better option? He probably is. Okay. Can we go to the Titans now? Yes. Uh, Marcus Mariota, new system, which on paper looked great. Um, John Filippo taking over a lot of the outside zone concepts, get him out of the pocket on the move, play action, all this fun stuff. Uh, probably a better system than they were running last year. Uh, big play action game and everything, but they've looked really bad. The first team offense, Mariota looked horrible last week, missing wide open Hall of Famer Corey Davis over the middle field by about ten yards. He's going to struggle to catch a thousand balls if Mariota can't get it. Well, get yeah, I was banking on having a quarterback that could throw the ball when I made the prediction that yeah. Corey Davis would have a thousand it, catches. Is there a more depressing um, two and three depth chart at quarterback than Blaine Gabbert and Luke Falk? That's rough. That's a little rough. So we need Mariota to stay healthy. So did you re- I tweeted out this weekend, Mariota throws an interception on the run. It's debatable how much was on him. The receiver kind of veered a little bit, but it looks like an ugly pass mm-hmm. to your boy Terrell Edmonds. Yeah, big up Terrell Edmonds. He made a play. Do you realize Mariota has the fifth worst grade on passes outside the pocket in his career over the last three years? Which for an athletic running around kind of quarterback is not ideal. Right. So and, and I think what I've noticed, because the guys at the top of the, the list, you're Aaron Rodgers expected, but you've got guys like Tom Brady, Ben Roethlisberger, Matt Ryan. It's all guys who are really good in the pocket and then out of the pocket it's your elite guys it's your top yeah. guys and they're able to make plays outside of structure if you're looking for a next step for Mariota it's this out of the pocket play and I'm talking designed rollouts and scrambles where he's you know a broken play he just doesn't have a great feel 
for throwing on the run and, and just being a playmaker outside the pocket so far in his career. It's, it's kind of it's not a shocking stat, but for a guy that is so athletic, it's something he needs to improve upon. <laughs> you think his problem is that now that he's not playing in the Pac-12 with Oregon, when he looks up, that backside dig isn't open by 10 yards and he doesn't know what open. to do? Yeah, that was, his, that was his throw, man. That was his throw. Right? So now he looks up, the backside dig's there, but actually there's a guy covering it now. So now you're screwed. Yeah. So they look very out of rhythm on offense, but they still have some very nice pieces with Derrick Henry and Deion Lewis in the backfield. Uh, the great Corey Davis to go with Taiwan Taylor, who's looked really good at receiver. Uh, Delaney uh, Walker at tight end. And then defensively. Delaney? Delaney? Yeah. Delaney Walker. Sorry. Oh, man. You get Harold Landry rushing off the edge, now you're living talking. up to his hype. And then add, you know, Logan Ryan, Kevin Byard, Malcolm Butler. There's a lot of nice pieces on this team. Once again, I don't think it's crazy to see them challenging the Jags for the division. Uh, I think the defense could be pretty good. I think there's a lot of talent there, and there's a lot of young talent. They could get better in a hurry um, or at least go on a good run. I do question the offense. Mariota is not looking great, which is concerning. I don't know if he's ever going to really progress beyond just this borderline average starter, a guy who you, uh, you, you should be looking to upgrade upon, even if you could probably build something special around him. So we'll call that the Andy Dalton, the Ryan Tannehill, whatever it is. Yeah. He's probably a step above that, but... The key for that guy, the guy in the middle tier, is your supporting cast, your play calling. They're banking on the play calling being much better than last year. And uh, I, think, I guess the concern is Mariota struggled so badly in non-play action situations where it's just you versus the defense, you know you're passing, his numbers took a massive hit, and usually that's the stuff that stays consistent. I think the play action game's still going to be good. That's Filippo's thing. It's those third and longs where he's got to you know, drop back and, and survey the field and throw that... Uh, might be a question mark. Yeah. I mean, year. the other thing is what we're what, yeah what we're seeing with those guys is that when if you have a guy whose baseline is basically average, you need everything else to be really good to elevate them. And right. Everything else doesn't look really good. I mean, it looks okay, but it's not. You're not looking at that and saying, yeah, that's going to make Mariota have a better season. Yeah, I mean, that was again. I point to the Dalton 2015. Yeah, that that brought him to a good a statistical season. Before we get into the last two divisions, Sam, we've been. Uh, doing some work with our friends over at my bookie, and I'll be I'll be taking George and Eric's lock of the week <laughs> and making picks this year. You laughing at me? You, well, you're going right out on a limb there. <laughs> I'm willing to go with the lock of the week and nothing else. Well, yeah, it's, if it's the lock of the week, it's the best pick that George and Eric bring to the table. Every it's going to be every single week at ProFootballFocus.com. You get it with your Green Line package, which is a part of Elite. We give one free pick, which is the lock of the week, and then you get the rest of the picks with Green Line. Why wouldn't I go with the lock of the week? Which is fueled by the entire PFF database. I'm I'm fine with going. I just you might want to get a bit more adventurous as you go. You know we've got other picks out there as well. Greenline gives you selection, not just one. You were talking when you initially told me this. You were going to take ten percent of your bankroll for the lock of the week each each uh, each each week. Yeah, that's not the most you know. Well, I have a I have a it's cap not the most aggressive it. spending span. It's because I have I've a cap of, of what I'm spending. <laughs> All right, well, maybe we'll go 50 bucks a game. We'll see. Oh, wow. Now we're, now, we're, now we're moving. But remember, who you're betting on, it's just as important who you're betting with. That's why I'm always telling people to bet with my bookie. Trust me, guys, this is your best bet this season. They've been in business for years. They've got great reviews online, and their mobile site is easy to use. So lay down some cash and win big today. This is great when you have PFF Greenline. I would only re- recommend a service to my listeners that's been good to me. That's what my bookie has been. So I'm urging you. To play with them, you win, they pay. They have live, in-game, live betting. The most rewarding player perks in the business. And for your fantasy guys out there, you can even bet the over-under on how many fantasy points a player will score each game. So join now, and my bookie will match your deposit dollar for dollar, Sam. So they're just going to straight-up match whatever you put in. When you use the promo code PFF to activate the offer, visit my bookie online today. That's M-Y-B-O-O-K-I-E. And don't forget to use the promo code PFF when creating your account to claim your bonus. You play, you win, you get paid. This is amazing. You guys, you know, America is now joining the rest of the world um, with this whole gambling thing. You know, anyone that's watching Sky Sports in the UK or whatever, like every sport has been basically powered by gambling for the past five or ten years. So, this, you know, America's finally catching up. It's been a touchy subject for a while, I guess. Proud that's of you guys. Thank you. Appreciate it. We're, we're here. We're all here. What America's direction are we going here, to now? Of us. Let's go north. AFC North. north. That's okay. where we live. We're in Cincinnati. Uh, well, actually, the Cincinnati Bengals might be pretty good. We'll talk about them. Baltimore Ravens, Pittsburgh Steelers, and the Cleveland Browns. Let's start with the hometown 
Cincinnati Bengals. Okay. Our first well, actually, with hundred to one to yes. win the Super Bowl. Yeah, we're we, we're bre- we're going to break it down with Sports Illustrated next week on their SI Now show. We've got a nice relationship with them again this year. We'll be on that show every single week. And our first segment is well, actually, the Cincinnati Bengals are going to be better than you think. Mm-hmm. Hundred to one to win the Super Bowl, which is lower than the Jets, which is lower than the Browns, who have won one game in the last thirty-two. Uh, that seems I harsh. Tie Rod now. To Rod. It's not Tyrod. That's what he said. Well, it's actually not what he said. It's what other people have said. Right, exactly. I think they're making it up. I don't know. That was like when I wanted to make this fake rumor that Shaq Mason was going to be a first rounder and see how far it went. He should have done that. He'd look smart. I know, right? But then other people are doing that with Tyrod's name. Tyrod. Tyrod. I think he could probably fudge it. He could put it somewhere in the middle. Tyrod. 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 Say it really quick, then nobody can tell. Anyway, Baker should be the quarterback there. But let's talk Bengals. They're getting better in, in key areas. That, that seems, that's my theme here, right? My, my, two years ago, I was talking about the Eagles. they got a really good roster, but they're bad at receiver. They're bad at corner. When you look at the Bengals, potentially really good at receiver with A.J. Green, emerging John Ross, Tyler Boyd is a nice number three, and then they've got the great William Jackson at corner to go with. Talked about the Jags' defensive line, the Bengals' defensive line, top three in yeah. the NFL as far as rushing the passer. That's huge. Here's the thing. I don't think this roster was ever as bad as it looked because they they just were mani- they managed to get bad enough at one specific spot that it could derail everything. That's true. So we talked before about offensive line. It's not about how good your offensive line is. It's about how bad the weakest links were. And the Bengals' weakest link was four out of five wet tissue paper. Yeah. I don't know if you if you can imagine a chain, heavy steel chain links, all those links, perfect, beautiful steel, galvanized. It's not going to rust. It's perfect. And then one of those links is wet tissue paper. That chain's not going to last very long. You're saying they only had one weak link last year? Well, I'm saying at least one of wet tissue paper. Yeah, so, they, had, they had multiple, though. That was the issue. Well, okay. Good analogy, though. Good, you're a good Either analogy, way, guy. that chain is not holding up very long. And it didn't. And they had to change the entire offense. And the whole thing was a disaster because of that offensive line. Now, you bring in Cordy Glenn at left tackle. That is a monster upgrade over Oboihe. Um, Billy Price, their first-round pick at center. Now, we don't know what Billy Price is yet, but I would bet good money there's no way he can be worse than Russell Bodine. So let's assume it's an upgrade, however significant yet to be determined. That offensive line all of a sudden isn't terrible. And and that's what it's about. It's not about getting good. It's about just not being terrible. Creep back toward average, Sam. Yep. There you go. So they're getting better in the right places. Um, And then I think the bigger picture situation here is when you look at the NFC, which we'll talk about soon, they're just, I mean, anybody can really win the NFC, right? Yeah. Almost any team. You could, you could see this path. In the AFC, there's like a few of them. So the Bengals could sneak in. I mean, you just need to sneak into the top six in the AFC. They can do that. Also, this is foolish because by the time you listen to this podcast, it could very well no longer be true. But Tyler Eifert is healthy at the moment. That's a good point. And when Tyler Eifert was healthy for a full season, he is capable of completely transforming that offense. He legitimately is one of the top three receiving tight ends in the NFL. Absolutely. He gives you this alternative option to A.J. Green that nobody else can bring, including, you know, John Ross, the other receivers on that roster. They can't really do what Tyler Eifert can do, which is drag deep coverage away from A.J. Green. So uh, if he stays healthy for any extended period of time, they're a different offense. Will the Bengals use John Ross the same way the Chiefs use Tyreek Hill? Just go deep? Well, every time Tyreek Hill... Every time the defense relaxed a little bit and he had pure man coverage, Alex Smith's like, all right, I'm going to give you a shot deep. I mean, John Ross could, could be that guy. Yeah. And when they do have that safety, keeping an eye on him, obviously that's opening it up for Eifert and A.J. Green. It looks great on paper. And even if the offensive line isn't fantastic, guys that get open protect the quarterback because you get the ball out of his hands quickly. Yeah, so I'm not wild on guys that have speed and nothing else. I'm not saying this is John Ross, but just conceptually, right? If you just have a fast receiver, a lot of people love those guys you know, just because they're fast. Right. I'm not huge on that, but what that does do is it presents a threat to the defense every single play. regardless something that they have to Regardless of whether you're actually going to take advantage of it, they cannot relax and and not because if as soon as you do that guy runs past you and it can be a touchdown instantly so john ross has the kind of speed where even if he's not going to be a good receiver he will be dangerous to your defense every single snap how often the Bengals choose to go at that is another matter i mean like you said the chiefs basically took a look up and if tyree kill was in man coverage 
they threw it his way, like right. instantly. It was like an auto check. If he's one on one on the outside, there's nothing over there. We're throwing it his way deep, and we're going to see what happens. Now the Bengals may not do that, but you do need to honor that every single play. And if you don't, like, and the reason you wouldn't is if you were warping the coverage over towards AJ Green, you're pulling safeties, you know, you're leaning things away. The second you do that, John Ross is five yards behind the guy that can't run with him. Yeah, and, and all that said, I, I, he's more than just a deep receiver yeah. anyway. I mean, we liked him as a first-round pick coming out because of the quicks off the line of scrimmage. and some Well, we saw that touchdown game. from the other day where not only did he beat the guy deep, but he then pulled some obscene move to leave two guys basically lying on the floor five yards from the end zone and walked in. Deshaun Jackson type of potential. Yeah, there you go. I believe. Deshaun Jackson. All right, let's go to the Steelers. Uh, they've won the division mm-hmm. last couple of years. They are the best team in the division, I think, still. Is there enough... Is there enough to doubt them, though? I mean, when I look at that defense, it seems like they've they've gotten better on defense the last few years. They've had some young guys continue to improve. You know, Stephon Tewitt, Cameron Hayward. Guys are emerging, but I still always feel like they're just a step short when it comes to playing the best teams. Yeah, that's. I, I think this, it's going to be the same story, I think, again, for the Steelers. They're going to win the division. Um, they're going to run into a very good team in the playoffs, and they're probably going to come up short because the defense just isn't good enough to stop. I mean, honestly, their season may honestly come down to whether they hit the New England Patriots or not. Like, if the playoffs fall in such a way that they're able to avoid them somehow, right. you know, the Patriots get knocked out by somebody else, the Jags say, um, it's just somehow it falls that the Steelers and the Patriots, that the Patriots are not lying between the Steelers and the Super Bowl, that's the way they progress. I think if they have to run in to the Patriots, it's going to be the same deal. If for no other reason, then... There is still nobody on that defense that can cover Gronkowski. Well, yeah, that's always going to be an issue. And again, I point I point to that game as a game where the Steelers played their game plan as well as they could other yeah. than that aspect of the game. They controlled the game. They kept the ball out of Brady's hands. They limited possessions for the Patriots, and they still came. And I know they should have won it with the Jesse James touchdown they and all really that should've. stuff, but it was still such a close game where New England ends up winning when so many things went right. They got criticized a lot for that game plan, and I actually think the game plan was entirely the right one. It was essentially objective fact that that Patriots defense or offense struggles more against man coverage schemes than it does against zone schemes. They're just able to pick apart zone too easily, and the Steelers play more zone than anybody else. So I think it was right to completely pivot, go 180, and go, we're going man-heavy. But they're just not good at that, though. They're just, it's but they, just not they were thing. fine at it outside of the fact that they had Sean Davis one-on-one with Gronkowski. Here's, here's part of it, too, and Zach Robinson brought this up, which I think is fantastic. It's not as simple as just play man, because when you play a team like the Patriots, too, it goes empty all the time, and when you go empty, there's a running back out wide this time, then mm-hmm. he's in the slot, and Gronk's out wide, then he's in the slot. The, just, just the communication no, of matching of, up yeah. is difficult. It is. But the other thing about this is I actually think their defense, personnel-wise, is better suited for man coverage than it is zone. Well, we said that about Artie Burns in yes. particular. So, But look, everything worked. They didn't get exposed by a whole bunch of blown coverages and miscommunications. Everything was fine, except Sean Davis was not capable of living with Rob Gronkowski at all. Um, and I don't know that they fixed that. We've talked a lot about Terrell Edmonds and how he's potentially the guy that can do that. We talked about um, the linebacker, Matthew, Matthew Thomas, Thomas, could potentially yeah. do that. But until they find a guy to do that, they're going to have the same problem, right? They're going to run into the Patriots. They may be able to live with most of that offense, but they can't stop Gronk. And as long as they can't stop Gronk, he's going to put up 150 yards, two touchdowns, and you then need to overcome that on the other side. So as much as we talked about the, the, the Chiefs looking like a Big 12 team where mm-hmm. it's going to be explosive, what about on offense? Big Ben thrown to, of course, Antonio Brown. But Juju Smith-Schuster, who exceeded my expectations last year, he's still young, still developing. James Washington. James Washington. All of, not all of a sudden. I mean, they've always been an explosive offense. But all of a sudden, there are some potentially really, really good compliments to Antonio Brown. And, of course, if Le'Veon Bell's back out there, man, this offense can put up some points in a hurry. And even if he isn't, James Conner's been playing really well in preseason. Now, I'm not saying James Conner is Le'Veon Bell, but he's been able to get ex- execute that offense without a significant drop-off. Jalen Samuels, too. A guy that played tight end and running back, or every position at NC State played in the slot, another mismatched. And we've guy. seen in the past that when Le'Veon Bell does miss games, they're still able to win. They're still able to play the same kind of stuff with you know D'Angelo Williams, etc. They're fine on offense. Uh, offensive line wise, so much consistency. They're trotting out the same starting lineup again. Mm-hmm. Ali Villanueva, Ram- Ramon Foster, Marquise Pouncey, David DeCastro, Marcus Gilbert. Those guys have been together for a while. That consistency very rare. Yeah. in the NFL, and still one of the better offensive lines 
A couple more teams. Let's go to the Ravens. Uh, rejuvenated Joe Flacco this year with Lamar breathing down his neck, Sam? Yeah. I mean, he may be better this year, but, I mean, how good is rejuvenated Joe Flacco? So I honestly think, so the last year he was, we would consider him good, would be 2014. He had Gary Kubiak as the offensive coordinator. I thought he was really good throwing to the intermediate level. The last few years, like, look, he hasn't been good, but he's still at his best when he's a little bit more aggressive, throwing the ball down the field. He doesn't have the same cannon for an arm everybody thinks that he has. But when he was aggressive, when he had Todd Heap, when he had Anquan Bolden, when he had Derek Mason, guys that he could throw the ball down the field to, he could at least give them a chance to make plays. And then statistically, you can kind of get up into the top half of the league. I mean, that's, I think, their best bet. The last few years, for a guy that supposedly has a cannon, he's just been, he's been Alex Smith-ish type of conservative. Yeah. I don't know what, what his been. ceiling is, but I will say that at the very minimum, they have dramatically improved maybe the worst wide receiver group in the NFL. They were vying with the Bears last season for just the worst group of receivers you could possibly ask a quarterback to throw to. Right. Um, the Bears... We're expecting a rookie to deal with that. The Ravens were expecting Joe Flacco to deal with that. Neither of them worked particularly well. But Willie Sneed, I really like. Oh, I knew it was going to be weapon. because of Willie Sneed. Not just Willie. Michael Crabtree is a good receiver. He's you know never going to be top five, but he's a good receiver. Agreed. John Brown has been making plays in preseason. He's got some speed and some ability. Like Brashad Perriman is still there. We saw, I mean, we've seen the good and bad from him in preseason, right? Stone handed drops that looked ridiculous. Paddle handed spec. There you go. Yeah. But big plays in the end zone, proving that you can't quite write him off yet. Right. There's still something there. Um, Greg Little. <laughs> God, Greg Little still It's a little football. Greg Little. Uh, but, I, like, the receivers are there from this year. Two tight ends, Hayden Hurst and Mark Andrews that they drafted. So, as much as, it, you know, the narrative is all this, well, now. Uh, Lamar Jackson's behind him. He's all motivated. It may be as simple as he's got some receivers that are half decent for once. Yeah, Lamar Lamar doesn't look ready to play. No. Um, I don't think the scouting report is that far off on him, though. You know, accuracy issues. Yeah. Um, he is looking to run a little bit more than I expected. I mean, we sat here all offseason saying, no, he wants to win from the pocket. He wants to win from the pocket. Watching him, it's almost like he'll drop back, leave a pocket too early, run, take a hit he shouldn't hit, and in the next play he's like, all right, let me – let me go through my reads a little bit longer. Some and he's, he's trying to make those adjustments, but he's got to cut back on the big hits. Some of those hits are terrifying. They are. He's just going to die doing that. You can't do that. Uh, we, on the defensive side, uh, certainly need to rush the passer a little bit better than they did. Uh, Tim Williams looks a little bit more like college Tim Williams this right? year, which is nice. And you get him opposite Terrell Suggs. I, don't, I can't really bank on Suggs again. That, wow. was, that was kind of an anomaly for a guy that's supposed to be on the decline of his career, and the numbers were pointing towards a decline until last season. I don't think you can bank on Suggs or Tim Williams. I mean, you can't bank on their pass rush, I think, but the potential is there for it to be good. Yeah, and the secondary is just a whole bunch of potential, too. When Jimmy Smith gets back from suspension to go with Brandon Carr, Marlon Humphrey, and then Tony Jefferson and Eric Weddle at safety, I mean, when they're all healthy, it's a pretty good secondary. And Tavon Young, who's coming back Tavon, after injury. that's right, too. Uh, so that's the Ravens and then the Cleveland Browns. Uh, we made the the grand point, um, not to trash Deshaun Kaiser, but he had a pretty poor season last year, uh, so much to the point that when George and Eric are running their wins above replacement number, he had the lowest one we've seen in years, and Tyrod was pretty good at that number, and just switching those two in equals, what, four wins? Five. Five wins. Yeah. Just for those two. Typically, a quarterback is worth, you know, actual wins above replacement which makes sense, right? If you've got a guy starting in the National Football League, he should be worth more than a guy than you off the street. Right. So like out of 32 quarterbacks, at least 31 of them are going to be in positive yes. in the wins so they are going to be worth, category. <laughs> they are going to be worth actual tangible wins over a guy you can drag in off the street tomorrow. Kaiser was so bad that he was worth losses over a guy that you drag in off the street tomorrow. So in theory, this number says that if you replace Deshaun Kaiser with spin a dice or Todd spin, Bowman yeah like spin the wheel of fortune for every available free agent quarterback right now you would have won two more games than the Browns won last season have we ever brought up Rick's idea for the backup QB house here on the podcast I don't think so I just think it's fascinating remind me what that is so all the backup quarterbacks you got like Matt Leiner uh -huh. you got Vince Young you got Todd Bowman Blaine Gabbert should probably be there they're just they're just living in a house hanging right. out keep staying sharp uh -huh. and when a team needs a quarterback you, you pull one out of the house at random, like, or yeah. is there like a competition? Or no, I think it's kind of at random. I mean, you just you following these guys along, and you know which which backup QB am I gonna? Okay, am I gonna pick out the backup QB house? Fair enough. Um, but you pick a guy out of the backup QB house, and they would have been better than Kaiser. Yeah. There you so go. just that alone, 
the Browns should be better. I've been saying for a long time they're better than this 0-16 look. Well, in theory, that number says they're five wins better off just with a change of quarterback, right? That doesn't factor in Denzel Ward in the first round. It doesn't factor in adding talent to that defense. Miles Garrett playing a full season, being fully healthy um, you know, the next year on. It doesn't factor in bolstering that offensive line. All, having said that, they're losing Joe Thomas for, what, seven games? Yeah, offensive played? line probably gets it's probably a, wash. a little bit. But Jarvis Landry. Um, Antonio Callaway. A full season, potentially, of Josh Gordon. Rashad Higgins. Rashad obviously. Higgins, of course. Um, so there's a lot more additions that have happened to that team in, in and above what you've had with just the five wins from the from the quarterback situation. So doesn't like, factor in Jabril Peppers playing strong instead of free safety. Yes. So Vegas is kind of going nuts on the Browns, and they've got them, you know, like I said, better odds in the Bengals, over six wins, I think, et cetera. And it kind of seems way too bullish based on what we know, you know, one win in 32 games. But, like you said, just going from Deshaun Kaiser to a viable quarterback is worth five, so it may not be crazy. Yeah, that's fantastic. So, yeah, when you look at the Browns, they should be much better. Mm-hmm. Are we rolling with Baker over Tyrod? Or, and this is, I mean, they're not going to. We need like some soft music I'm for Sam of, to decide I'm on this. I'm kind of bummed at this, right? Because I think the Browns legitimately have two viable quarterbacks right now, which is amazing because they've gone, what, 20 years without one. Now they might have two at the same time, and obviously you can only play one of them. So, yeah, look, Baker Mayfield is their quarterback of the future. Is he the quarterback of right now? He had a couple of really good preseason outings, one that wasn't quite so good. I, I don't think you can – I wouldn't hate the decision either way. I mean, Tyrod is good enough to win you games. There's no reason you should bench him unless you think that Baker Mayfield will definitely be better. I don't know right now he's definitely better, but he will be soon. I just roll with him. I'm, I'm seeing a lot of uh, buzz from Miles Garrett, uh, defensive player of the year hype. Mm. Yay or nay on that? I could see it. Have you, did you watch Hard Knocks, the most recent one? I missed it. He is freaky looking. Yeah, he's awesome. They they had him at one point changing, just whip the top off, look like, you know, like those He-Man uh, action figures when you were a kid, the ones that are just all muscles everywhere, Miles muscles where you don't have muscles. Yes, you know, like six packs on your ri- like on your, on your side. That's what he has. Like that's, my, Miles? that's what Miles Garrett looks like. Yeah, but there was a big the big negative coming out of the draft is he like he's a little soft. He likes to play an instrument. Mm. That was a real thing. Yeah, that people said. Yeah. Anyway. The Browns will be better this season. Let's go to the AFC East. Who beats the Patriots this year, Sam? Uh, nobody. So the Patriots are going to win the AFC East. Yep. Um, I do think it's a little more interesting for them. I think the, I don't want to say the defense should be better because ultimately they got to a good spot last year as far as not giving up a ton of points other than the first game of the season. First few games of the season, they were bad. Once they tightened up and then the, the Super Bowl. Bust. Yeah. Um, but so they should be better on defense. I think their pass rush, which was the biggest question mark for us this offseason on that defense, which always seems to be, I think they'll piece that together with Adrian Claiborne and Derek Rivers and Trey Flowers and the guys that they have there. Danny Shelton's looking pretty good this preseason. Oh, the thing we have to talk about with the Patriots right up until they cut them, they could legitimately play the McCourty swap thing in the secondary. Yeah, so our podcast listeners, if you guys have been with us for years now, especially last year, we did have a listener suggest why the, to, to, to answer why the Patriots were so bad. No, it was to answer why Jason McCourty was suddenly good. Oh, why he was playing well. Devin McCourty's grades weren't as great. Plus, we, put it, we pieced it together when we saw the coverage bust the mm. Patriots had. We decided that Jason McCourty was really playing Devin McCourty last year. Yeah, the twins swapped. Yeah. Instead of a test at school, Devin was in Cleveland. teams. Yeah. Now they can actually do it. Now they're, now they're both there, and they've been talking about moving Jason to safety. So you've got them both there at safety. Yeah, he's taking safety You snaps. could just, like, swap them back and forth constantly. Yeah. I don't know if you want to. Uh, I think you have to, just for giggles. But it had some nice depth there, the, the, the two McCordys. I think they've, I'm sure they've played some tricks. Sorry. Here. So the other interesting guy. Played some tricks on Belichick. On that defense is... Um, Jawan Bentley. Yes. I, I know where you're going. Who's I know where you're going with PFF it. grade was phenomenal last year. Yes. And when I looked at him on tape, you're like, okay, I really like what he does well. He destroys the run game. He can take on offensive line blocks the way most linebackers can't. 1988 call. They need that guy. Exactly. He's just this beastly run defender. Only that guy hasn't been in the league for 15 years. And those guys can't cover. And he couldn't really cover. But the Patriots draft him. And the Patriots can do things with players that other teams can't because they're prepared to not ask these guys to do things that are not able to do. So a guy like Dante Hightower, who actually 
has a lot of the same issues, has a lot of the same characteristics, traits as Bentley, they were able to hide that, right? They, yeah, they've, they've done well with Hightower to say he's not a great in coverage, but they found where his They send him on the blitz a lot. They use him as part of the pass rush, and they kind of minimize how often they're asking him to do crazy drops in zone and just do coverage things that linebackers are expected to do in today's NFL. So I was really intrigued by the Patriots drafting Bentley and saying maybe they can kind of get something out of this guy because he's really good at the things he's good at. And if ever a team is able to mask the things you're not good at, it's the Patriots. Um, and why that's interesting is because the preseason, he's been grading really well. He has been. Making a lot of plays in coverage as well and against the run. Uh, the question offensively for the Patriots, uh, left tackle with Nate Solder moving on. Trent Brown's looked okay there. Uh, it looks like he's going to be the guy taking over. Marcus Cannon, once he's healthy and back, probably at right tackle. It's either him or Adrian Waddle. So kind of some questions at the tackle position. They just locked up our boy Shaq Mason, long-term deal at right guard, despite giving up the game-ending sack. But would you leave Shaq game alone? losing sack last year. The guy year the came from an offense that never pass blocked at all. It's a great run blocker. Yeah. Uh, but there's everybody in New England's up in arms about the receiver situation. You know, they lose Brandon Cooks, where if you had I – I wanted to see the team last year with Brandon Cooks and Edelman on the field. Edelman gets hurt and misses the season. But, you know, there's not that – classic X receiver in the last few years where the Patriots have had a Brandon Cooks or they've had you know Brandon LaFell when he was playing well it just makes the offense a little bit better yep and Edelman's missing the first four games so it's just a matter of relying on Chris Hogan in some combination of Philip Dorsett Cord- uh, Cordero Patterson and there are some rumors that they're kicking the tires on trading for a Golden Tate you know they might be exploring those options which uh, I think Mr. Brady would be happy with. I'm sure he would. But when we talk before about how a guy a middling quarterback like Marcus Mariota or Andy Dalton needs a receiving group to elevate his play, Brady doesn't. So Brady will be one of the best quarterbacks and that offense consequently will be one of the best offenses in the league almost regardless of who is playing wide receiver. Yeah. Like the Patriots don't even need a guy that's good, they just need a guy that won't make mistakes. So if you run the right route, you're fine. Whether yeah, you run it well round, yeah. or whether you, you know, the, the scheme will get guys open to a certain degree. So, you know, the big problem with Chad Ochocinco is that he couldn't deal with the variety of option routes the Patriots ran. And consequently, even though he was maybe the most talented receiver they had for a long time, he wasn't, it, did, it wasn't a good fit because he couldn't rely on him being in the right place at the right time. The, if you, as long as you get a bunch of guys who will be in the right place at the right time, Brady will make use of that, and you'll you'll be fine. But he's getting old, Sam. He is. At some point, he's going to hit that wall and Look decline. At you. You've changed your tune, though. Four you're, years after the fact. Now you're talking him up. He's the best. Anyway, let's go to the rest of the AFC East. Miami Dolphins, uh, they're, they're in this position where I think you look kind of where I feel the Broncos have been. I just Every, every team has this optimism after what they've done in the offseason. I don't love what's happened with the Dolphins, not just losing guys like Indomitian and Sue, but... There's just I don't and again I don't even need name talent I just think that they're in rough in a rough position on the defensive side of the ball unless you have guys like Xavier Howard who look like look like Richard Sherman every week instead of just three weeks out of the year. Their draft was all about getting more athletic across the board. Like every single player they drafted was an athlete of some kind. I did like the draft. Um, I like what they did there. I, I um, yeah I like that. I'm applauding that. I think they actually drafted a lot of good players as well. The problem with that is. Most of those guys don't tend to hit the ground running. Yeah. Like you're an athlete, that's kind of your biggest calling card. And that typically means you're a little bit behind the eight ball when it comes to everything else. Right. Because you've been a supreme athlete all the way along and you, you haven't needed to be. Whereas in the NFL, most people are pretty supreme athletes. So a lot of that gets negated. Now, you'll still be able to be successful because you're still a supreme athlete, but you're going to need to learn how to play as well. So I think Micah Fitzpatrick could have a really big impact, but guys like Jerome Baker, um, Jacecki on, on, on offense, Kalen Balaj is never even able to put it all together in college. I think there's a lot of talent there. I just don't know if it's, it feels like a roster that's a couple of years away from actually doing anything. Yeah, I think, I, I think that's fair. You look at, you know, offensively, they add in Danny Amendola, they add in Albert Wilson. It's an intriguing set of playmakers. Uh, well, somebody's going to predict Ryan Tannehill's breakout for the twelfth straight year. Also, as well, some of the moves they made are just depressing as hell. You bring in, you've got Kenyon Drake, right? Who, aside from the fact that I predicted Kenyon Drake, you love Kenyon breaking Drake. out and therefore have something of a horse in this race. Objectively, last season, Kenyon Drake put up some pretty spectacular numbers. Average four and a half yards per carry after contact. 
which led the league by a distance, is an absurd number. He was really good. He had a bunch of breakaway runs. He looked like a spectacular ball carrier. In Miami scheme, you get contact in the backfield a lot. Yes. So what do they do? They bring in a 57-year-old Frank Gore, who you can guarantee will get you three yards per carry and then fall over. Three and a half. Okay, three and a half yards per carry and then fall over. And all that's going to happen is Frank Gore is going to chew up 150 carries that should, be, should belong to Kenyon Drake. We don't know that yet. We'll see. Okay, we don't know it, but would you like to bet some of your my bookie money that that will happen? No. No. Yeah. No. Coaches, coaches want to feed the, uh, the, the dependable guy. running backs too often. I'm more concerned on the defensive side of the ball. Beyond when you lose Sue pushing the, the pocket in the middle, major question marks in the middle with Jordan Phillips, Akeem Spence, Devon Godshow, Godshaw, and uh, Vincent Taylor. I like Taylor a little bit. But they're a team that's not great on the back end and not great rushing the passer. You can handle being bad at one, usually, or you can, you can mask it a little bit. That's going to be tough. I think they could be okay rushing the passer this year, though. Robert Quinn may be back. I don't know. He's man. not going to be back to 2012, Robert Quinn, because that guy seemed to okay. be like a complete freak. Let me, re- let me, let me position this differently. Uh-huh. You're relying on Cameron Wake, yes, who, who will... at some point has to slow down. No, He's been he great. will be good until he dies. Okay. So you've got Cameron Wake. You're you're hoping you're banking on a, a huge rebound for Robert Quinn. Yes. You're you're banking on a big year two jump for Charles Harris. No. And William Hayes. Yes. The other edge defender who's a little bit older. Always who's good. been just solid to really good the last few years. You're kind of banking on that four man rotation. Yeah. All being really well, good. Well, William Hayes is like a he's like an under he's like an unheralded version of Cameron Wake. He will just be good until he's retired. Right. He's always been good. He's always ridiculously productive. And for some reason, teams don't want to give him more than 250 snaps in a year. So William Hayes will be good in his rotation role. Cameron Wake will be good until like somebody drags him off the field and says, you can't play this game anymore. He's just freaky. Robert Quinn has been doing really well in preseason. There's three sacks. There's, I think, one more pressure. But they've been quick, like impre- uh, decisive plays, you know, which is kind of his calling card when he was good. 2013. Said he wins quickly and around the edge. He's been doing that again this year. He's, he's definitely more at home as a hand-in-the-ground defensive end. That's for sure. Remember Aaron uh, Campman, the defensive end for the Green Bay Packers? Yeah, the Jags tried to stand him up a little bit. There's a certain type of player that requires... Basically, there's no difference between a 3-4 outside linebacker and a 4-3 defensive end anymore. They're the same position... It's really just whether you're, you're standing up or you're, you're, your hand is in the dirt by right. an alignment point of view. You're in exactly the same position along the line of scrimmage, uh, laterally, horizontally. It's really just a case of what stance you're in. But there are certain players that need that four-point, three-point, four-point stance to coil and to be able to spring off the line and start going. There are guys like Von Miller who have, you know, just, they're just all quick twitch muscles. Yeah, it doesn't could, matter how you... You could line him up however you want, and he's the first move is just going to be instant off the line anyway. But there are other guys that need to be able to, to be in that coil position like a sprinter off the blocks and just explode out into their thing. I think Robert Quinn is one of those guys. Aaron Kampman was definitely one of those guys. Um, so maybe we get him back. So I don't think it's absurd to suggest Cameron Wake will be good. William Hayes will be good in smaller sample sizes. Robert Quinn could be impactful. And then Charles Harris was a first-round pick, so if he brings anything, you've got to, it's, it's a bonus, right? You feeling pretty good about the Dolphins, then? No. Just that, All that uh, edge rush a bit. All right, let's go to the Jets. Uh-huh. They just traded Teddy Bridgewater. I want to give a ton of kudos to the Jets. They signed Teddy Bridgewater in the offseason, ultimately just have to pay him $500,000, essentially, for the signing bonus, flip him for a third-round pick. Yeah, they basically bought a third-round pick for under a million dollars. It's fantastic. Yeah. I mean... Which, what when you the, consider the Browns... What did the Browns spend? 16 million? Yeah, like 16 million to buy a second rounder. So I liked that move. You flip Teddy Bridgewater, you get it. I mean, that's little moves like that, shrewd team-building moves. I think those things yeah. add up. And it also, and I made this point a couple months ago, as, as much as it's a little risky to give up a bunch of draft picks to move up three spots to go get a quarterback, even though we really like Sam Darnold, think he's going to be fine, there's a little bit of risk there. You give up these other draft picks. That's one way to kind of salvage that a little bit and you, you earn some picks back well particularly if you hit anywhere else in that draft right and they certainly from preseason they look like they've hit on their third round pick nathan shepherd who's yeah. been extremely athletic extremely productive the other spot i think they could potentially have hit is parry nickerson in the sixth we don't know yet because he's been banged up 
but a guy with 4-3 speed who graded exceptionally well at PFF. If they come out of this draft with Sam Darnold, their future franchise quarterback, current franchise quarterback, he's going to start for them. Yep. Nathan Shepard, who becomes a viable, productive member of that defensive line opposite Leonard Williams, and Parry Nickerson, a cornerback that can actually play and give them significant time, that's a haul. That's a really good draft, in addition to a third-round pick that you bought for giving Teddy Bridgewater a chance to prove he wasn't busted. Yeah, Uh, so now my concern on this thing, as much as I like Sam Darnold, youngest quarterback to start since, like, the merger, pretty much. Uh So really young. Um, he's he's going to what should be his redshirt junior season of college, and we're, we're playing behind an offensive line, which is not very good, not very good on paper historically, and a bunch of playmakers that we've talked about it quite a bit this offseason. They're just they threw a bunch at it to see what sticks. Don't know what's going to stick. Yeah, Robbie Anderson duplicating his deep threat, duplicating duplicating as a deep threat. Jermaine Curse, Ter- Terrell Pryor, Quincy Anunua. I mean. Where are they going with this whole thing? Our Darius Stewart, Chad Hansen, just a bunch of guys. If he doesn't have guys getting open and he's under pressure, people have criticized Darnold for being a little conservative this preseason. We might be seeing this, you know, 5.5 yards per attempt type of guy because he's got to be more conservative in the short game. Yeah, for some reason, Steve has become a big friend of of uh, yards per attempt as a statistic. Well, traditional stats. It's, I don't remember it's a you good ever one. mentioning that until like the last three weeks, and then you haven't shut up about it since. It's just a way of painting a picture. I've talked about it for years. What's it? <laughs> when I described Josh Allen and Wentz the last couple of years, I said they could be a, you know, like an eight yards per attempt guy, but low completion percentage I don't at their peak. That's true. Yeah, I was using that as an. Example. So what's interesting is that all three of the Jets' quarterbacks this preseason have a criminally low average depth of target. Um, Josh McCown has one of the lowest in the entire league. He is down at four, uh, four yards. Now, Alex Smith typically is the lowest quarterback in the league in this statistic, and he's around six out yeah, of general Six, year. six and a half. So four is insane. Um, Teddy Bridgewater uh, was at 6.6, so that's in that Alex Smith kind of range. And Sam Darnold was just ahead at 6.8. So those guys have all been on the hyper-conservative end of things, which is interesting because I think that does it, – it it's kind of squ- – it, it, uh, what does it do? It puts you in a less advantageous situation on a down-to-down basis because you're basically telling the defense that you don't need to worry about the stuff back there. You can crunch up, shrink all the areas, and tighten all the windows that we have to hit, which is – like it, it almost negates the thing that you're trying to achieve, which is right. – we make it. We make everything easier for you because we're only asking you to shoot from here to here. Well, you have to. But see. now we're going to ask you to shoot from here to here in a really tight window. Well, the only way you can succeed there too is if you have really good after the catch guys, and it's just an unbelievable scheme where those short passes are just open and you're just exploiting holes in the defense. Over. There's nothing wrong with short passing if it's the quarterback just continually making good decision after good decision, finding open receivers. At some point, you do have to take shots down the field. So yeah. that would be a concern for Mr. Donald. Still a big fan of his defensively i have plenty of concerns too i mean edge rush for the for the 10th straight year now for the jets like what how are they going to rush the passer and despite adding tremaine johnson in the secondary morris claiborne is just a yearly question mark you mentioned perry nickerson if they can get him healthy and see some time i think the secondary has enough question marks especially you know uh todd Bowles likes to play that aggressive man coverage I mean, you could get a good season out of Claiborne, but we're looking at one good season out of his entire career at this point. It wasn't even one. It was like half a good season. Yeah. So there's some concerns Agreed. for the Jets. Uh, I saw some people saying they were a borderline playoff team if they had Come Teddy. No. If they had Teddy. No, even with Teddy, they're not that good. It's not a great roster right now with the Jets. And then the Bills, not a great roster. And in some scary places, I, I want to give a ton of credit to Josh Allen this preseason. He's yeah. impressed me. Um, we were, I thought, critical yet very reasonable with mm-hmm. our offseason analysis of Josh Allen. Yep. I will be completely reasonable with my preseason analysis. He's been very impressive. Mm-hmm. Um, still have the same concerns. We, we're still in small sample size territory and again, a bit here. Like, a bit like Baker had a couple of really strong games and then took a step back. Yeah. Things went a bit awry. And a, a lot of that wasn't his fault. The Bengals' defensive front, as we talked about, Josh Allen, top right. three yeah. in the league. Um, and he got into problems because the offensive line was getting destroyed and Cincinnati was just burying him under pressure all day. Yeah, Vlad Dukas, Russell Bodine, who we already mentioned, 
has been one of the worst centers in the league for a John while. John Miller, Jordan Mills. I mean, that's a rough looking four out of five. You talked about one or two links of your chain going it being made out of tissue paper. That could be four. Yeah, when we talked about our offensive line rankings, like I could see this, I could see ways that teams like Seattle can improve. Houston, I've got major questions, but we're talking about these worst offensive lines in the league. The mm-hmm. Jets are up there. We just mentioned the Bills at the end of the season might end up with the worst offensive that line. That offensive in the league. line is ugly, and that's really the only question mark. With do you even start Josh Allen right away? Because I think from watching him play, I think he's probably ready in terms of yeah. he, he can do the stuff that we were questioning, actually. Seen some pocket movement. Yeah. The short area accuracy has been better. I still want to see it yeah. more consistent, but like a lot of the places where I'd like to see him improve, he's Here's been better. Here's the thing, though. One, I mean, this. so Nathan Peterman was a guy who, we, we, he graded well in college, right? He was, he was a, solid in college, and he, he was, was good, really good in our accuracy charts. Yes, he was a good college player. He was really accurate. He, his questions were at arm strength, and that's why he went in the fifth round. Then he got on the field when they insisted on benching Tyrod Taylor slash Tyrod um, and had maybe the worst half of football anybody's ever had in the history of the game, right? Yeah. And that's probably something you're never actually going to come back from. That's but not, No, he's fine. No. But you can't bank not all personally, of it but... You can, so because now the thing is, from preseason alone, I think you would have to objectively say that Nathan Peterman has outplayed Josh Allen. But can you possibly roll into the season starting Nathan Peterman, given what happened the last time? Yes, I think you can. Look, first off, he's outplayed him against backups. Secondly, on the other hand, I'm not going to hold one horrendous game. So like Kevin Hogan had a worse game. Last year, than Peterman's game, maybe than the five interception game. Like Kevin Hogan's one start last year was horrendous. Mm. His other starts in previous years were were bad, but not that bad. And nobody will ever start Kevin Hogan again. Look, I'm not completely dismissing Nathan Peterman because of one game against the Chargers. I'm not. I'm saying, can you start him after that? Yeah, I think so. Because other people, I don't think it's crazy to do it. I don't think it's crazy to do it. I'd roll with Josh Allen. So you got. For all the people that were like, hey, at Wyoming, Josh Allen had no supporting cast and all that stuff, which was a little BS, the, now it's valid. Yeah, If he, so that's if he goes problem, out there in right? Buffalo, it's valid. You've got a few different things at play here. You've got one, Nathan Peterman probably outplayed him. I think there is something to that. Two, I don't know if you can actually start Nathan Peterman rolling into a season without the city rioting, given what he did the last time he started. Three, that offensive line could be the worst in the league. The receiving core is pretty wretched looking. Um, it's a terrible, terrible situation to be putting a quarterback into. And this is a playoff team last year. Yes. And they were a playoff team mostly, almost solely because they could cover a little bit in the back end. Because mm-hmm. they made some really, they were really good in coverage. Tred- Tredavious White was outstanding, one of the best corners in the NFL. They played a lot more zone coverage, and they just kept games close. And because and Tyrod, Tyrod was, was the quarterback. Yeah, and Ty- Tyrod was solid. Because you can do a hell of a lot worse than solid, which they subsequently proved by benching him and putting in Nathan Peterman. That's true. So Buffalo, again, in this wide-open AFC. I-, I know we wrote off the Jets and some other teams. The AFC is so wide open. We're going to be sitting. Here's my prediction. We're going to be sitting here in week eight, and teams like the Dolphins and maybe the Jets might be Three and three, four and two, somehow. Oh, there's going to be some right? rough teams in playoff contention. Right. That's why, like the AFC, it's going to be like, oh, look yeah. at this emerging team. And eventually, it'll all even out, and then there'll be some like eight and eight teams. Well, look what in happened there. last year. I mean, it was the Bengals, the Ravens, all these teams. The same deal, right? Yeah. The Bills made the playoffs. They required the Bengals beating the Ravens with an Andy Dalton. He even hope expecting more of the same at the de- yeah. It's going to be the same stuff. The good teams in the AFC will be good, but there won't be many of them, and there will be some bad teams making the playoffs. Uh, let's run through picks real quick. We took, we didn't, we forgot to do it. Chargers, mm-hmm. AFC West. Who you got in the South? Jaguars, Titans. Jags. Jags. I'm gonna take the. No. I'll take the Jags as well. Yeah. Uh, AFC North. Uh, Steelers. Steelers. Yeah. Oh, we got the Steelers. We got the Patriots in the East. Mm-hmm. Who wins the they AFC? Need two wild cards. Oh man, wild card. Cincinnati Bengals. Okay. And the Chiefs. Did I forget somebody that should be in there? No. I would go... Oh, uh, Titans, maybe. No, come on. AFC South. I, I would like go, Titans. I would go Chiefs. Uh, I don't think an AFC East team is coming out of it. It's probably going to be from the North. So let's say the Ravens. The Ravens? Yeah. They're always there or thereabouts, right? Yeah. I think the ti- Titans and the Colts in the South. 
are the teams to watch, depending on Andrew Locke, depending on I like the Titans roster still. They've only ever been able to get to the playoffs because they didn't have the Jags good in the division. Now the Jags are good. They've got problems. Jags are going to regress this season, though. Nah. Uh, so who's winning the AFC? I mean, I'm going to take New England. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's New England unless they. It doesn't, it doesn't mean it's locked in stone. It's just your Here's the thing, right? best it's, odds. Yeah. It's New England unless somebody other than the Steelers play, knocks them out. Then I think the Steelers win. Chargers. If anybody knocks the, the Patriots out, the Steelers win the AFC. I don't love the Steelers this year. We'll see what happens. Don't love them this year. So that'll do it for us. AFC preview. We'll have a full NFC preview at some point. This one went long, Sam. A lot of information in here. It's almost uh, hard to predict. Welcome back, YouTube. Good to be back out here. Of course, don't forget to check out everything over at ProFootballFocus.com. If you're on the YouTube channel currently, be sure to hit the subscribe button. If you're just listening on the pod, go subscribe to the YouTube channel. ton of great content coming this year. And, of course, the PFF products, PFF Edge, and Elite, everything you need here during fantasy season and to carry you through the entire NFL football season. We'll chat again next time with some NFC season.